Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome, uh, thanks uh, for coming to the EI seminar. I'm really excited to welcome Jajun back to MIT. Jajun is currently an assistant professor at Stanford uh, and working on computer vision, machine learning, and computational cognitive science. Uh, before join, joining Stanford, he was a visiting faculty researcher at Google Research, and then he did his he got his PhD here at MIT. Uh, and his his work research has been recognized with many dissertation awards, such as the ACM Digital Dissertation Award, uh, the A Triple ACM Sig AI Doctoral Dissertation Award, and the MIT George M Sprouse PhD Thesis Award in Artificial Intelligence and Decision Making, as well as uh, 20, uh, 20 Samsung AI Researcher of the Year. Uh, he also received the IROS Best Paper Award for Cognitive Robotics, uh, and he has received various fa uh, faculty research awards as well as graduate uh, fellowships. I'm really excited to welcome Jajin to give a talk. Thank you. Hey, uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Ian. Thanks for having me here. Um, I just saw it says connection is stable. So people on Zoom, first, can you hear me well? Okay. And also, if anytime there's a connection issue, Maybe you can either speak up or uh, send a send a message, and uh, I hope Eden will be able to monitor, and then we can fix that. Actually, Leslie, for example, can you hear me? You're good. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, let's get started. Uh, okay, I should probably turn on the video as well, so that I can, maybe can people can see me a little bit. Um, okay, um, so uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, I started Stanford two years ago and then, you know, having continued working on computer vision, machine learning, AI in general uh, with some robotics. Um, so today I'm going to talk mostly about uh, computer vision stuff, the perception stuff, which is, you know, it's embodied, maybe not that embodied, but hopefully it will be embodied enough that's still suitable for, for this seminar. So uh, I'm going to talk about understanding the visual world through naturally supervised code. So visual world, straightforward. Code, what does that mean? I guess we, we all sort of realize, yeah, there's some structure right, in the pictures here. You know, there are patterns in the textures and the geometry. You know, some of, of the figures are from those MIT called papers. And the patterns, uh, you know, we have, uh, we see, especially in artifacts like objects and buildings. Um, so what does it mean by naturally supervised? Hopefully, you know, at, at the end of the talk, I can, um, I can deliver that clearly. Um, okay, so let's get started. You know, so there are rich structures in the visual world, right? So if you're looking at, uh, you know, staying in a corridor, looking at a building, then you realize, you know, there are a lot of, you know, um, symbolic concepts there. You know, in many cases they're sort of ignored, but but it is really there, and we use them a lot. You know, um, there are planes. You know, the world has, you know, the corridor has a has a ceiling, has a floor, has two walls. And you know th these things are reflection symmetric, right? So there are symmetries going on, and there are repetitions, right? The lights are repeating themselves, and the you know buildings has a number of floors, and every floor has you know windows and rooms, right? So they're sort of they, they clearly look identical to me, you know, not identical in the sense of the pixel values because there's perspective projections and stuff like that. But I know that in their line, you know, they're exactly the same room. They should be almost identical. So now the question is, you know, is it possible for us to leverage such kind of structural information for seeing understanding for smart, efficient, data efficient, but also, you know, in general, efficient, uh, generalizable seeing understanding and interaction, right? So interaction in the context of, you know, computer vision graphics, oh, that would be like, you know, scene editing. Um, so what we want to do is, here is an example about, you know, some of the, uh, the demos we would like to uh, achieve. Uh, that is, um, we put this into this Adobe Photoshop GUI, but underlying it is actually our algorithm. So given an image of a building like this, um, you know, we would like to first do like interactive segmentation. That is kind of straightforward, right? Just give it a bunny box and then uh, you can select the objects. And then, you know, you can compute things like vanishing point. These are all standard vision algorithms. But then if I ask you, okay, how would the building look like if I make it taller? Right. So based on the vanishing point, you should be able to drag it. Okay, then just in one shot, you know, you can make the building taller. And you wanted to, and then you know how would it look like you want to make it wider. Right. So so this is like, you know, it has to, you know, to do this, this is you know really implemented by our algorithm. Javan is an author, I'm going to talk about it later. Um, but what's uh, so you have to take care of a lot of things, right? Including, you know, of course you want to get a structure right. They're the same room. So if you make it taller, sure, there are infinite number of possibilities. But, you know, if you ask me to guess, I would say, yeah, you know, the room should just be the same. I just want to make the building taller. They should respect the textures, right? They should all look the similar. They should respect 3D vision, perspective projection. That is, okay, things are closer to you. They should appear slightly larger and they should have the same 3D orientations. 
right? So all these things you have to consider is a combination of, you know, low level textures that are hard to describe but that are better captured by deep networks as well as the higher level often symbolic parts that are, you know, if you can smartly wire in into your AI systems. Okay. So this is, you know, sort of inspired by uh, recent advances. Now, not that recent now. Also from MIT, you know, Armando and Josh's group, uh, Kevin Ellis, they did try to do program synthesis on visual data. So given an uh, image like this, um, they have, uh, you know, these kind of sketches. You know, clearly there are some structures. These are like line drawings. So they're like, okay, can we vectorize the image, right? You're given a rasterized image and now you want to vectorize it. You're like, okay, I know the image has a number of lines and rectangles. Um, so um, they use a combination of learning and stochastic search to vectorize the image. And now you're working in a much lower dimensional space, right? You don't have like 200 by 200, you know, image and then with all the pixels, but you only have like nine objects. So you're in a much lower dimensional space. And then you can say, okay, now I can use uh, learning and program synthesis because program synthesis is hard to scale to very high dimensional state spaces. So now you're in a, in a lower dimensional vectorized space. You can use a combination of learning and program program synthesis to get a programs. And what you can do uh, with that is, okay, now you can do extrapolation, right? If I change three to five, uh, I can make the pattern bigger. So this is kind of pretty cool, but this work, and, and it, as well as a follow-up we did on extending that to 3D, uh, all have this kind of pretty obvious issues. That is, oh, here you're assuming the world is just made of lines and rectangles. You assume you, you know all the primitives, but that's not the case in natural image, right? If you want to generalize to a natural image, you have a bowl of milk with cereal. Sure, there are some objects there, the cereals, and they have some patterns, but what would be the primitives here? It's no longer lines and rectangles, and there's no way you can specify a library of all the objects you encounter in your daily life, right? So um, we got inspired from you know, classic work in computer vision, so there's some work on internal learning or single in learning from a single image trying to explore what is the statistics of natural images or more generally you can say it's the image prior, right? So given an image on the bottom left, uh, you will say, oh yeah, you can see uh, there are patches that look similar to each other. Uh, you know, this is, uh, uh, I think a pretty famous picture from Harry Rani's group from, uh, from Israel, right? She has been working on, her group has been working on this for decades. Um, so if you look at an image of a, at, at the bottom left, you realize there are patches that are really similar to each other, right? So those red, those, such kind of a, I would say similarity can happen at the same scale, like those red boxes, but you know, they can also happen across scales, right? The, the green boxes, right? One is much larger than the other, but you know, they're clearly the same thing. They just have, uh, they just show objects at different scales. And the reason that they're similar to each other is because essentially they're the same object, right? The same type of object. They, they are grasses, and I know they're the same category of grasses. And the reason that the objects that are closer to me, you know, are, uh, appear to be larger is because, you know, there's perspective projection, right? The closer things, of course, they appear to be larger, but they have to be, uh, they have to look similar just because, you know, they're the same category of objects, right? So that's why you, you can see all those kind of similarities or statistics that exist within patches of a single image. So just from a single image, you don't need any prior knowledge, you don't need any pre-training, you know, you should be able to discover patterns like this. So of course, you know, people have tried to combine that with deep learning. In 2017, people are like, given an image like this, if I take the activation maps of this image, get by a pre-train Alex, let's say AlexNet, you pre-train AlexNet on ImageNet, and you send this image into this pre-train AlexNet, you can take the activation maps. And then you can compute um, for uh, all the X, Y displacement, right? If I shift these feature maps by a certain displacement of X and Y, well, what will be the correlations of these feature maps, right? How likely they're going to self-correlate, right? So uh, the more likely they're going to self-correlate, that shows, okay, the particular pair of X, Y is more likely to be exactly the distances or the gap between two neighboring repeating objects, right? Because essentially you're moving the feature maps to a certain extent and then, oh, the feature maps are likely to be the same. Then that means, okay, these objects are likely to be the same objects. And the, the benefit of using a pretty network uh, instead of just pure RGB values is, you know, Images are messy to work with, and you know there are like noises, occlusions, lighting changes. So uh, pre-trained, you know, especially these recognition networks, they're supposed to be more invariant um, to these changes. Okay, then what you can do is you can identify the gaps between these repeating objects, and you can locate uh, the centroids of these repeating objects on the bottom right. So we got inspired by this idea. Of course, we made some changes to it, and uh, what we can do now is we can localize the centroids of these repeating objects for a natural image. Again, this is single image learning, so there's no pre-training. That's good because that shows you can generalize to a new object. You're not assuming the world is made of lines and rectangles then it doesn't work with circles, right? So you can locate the central of these repeating objects. In some sense, you can think about it 
is you're doing the same thing that is to vectorize, but now vectorize an actual image. And again, now you go back to the problem that you know how to solve, that is you're working in a lower dimensional space, you can use you know, learning search and program synthesis to search for a program that explains what is there uh, in an image. And you know, particularly what is the, the, the primitive, what is the exact object, how that is represented, is not represented by a neural network, right? Can be a recognition network, and if you use it for image generation, then it can be a synthesis. So the application here is um, once you're given an image like this, right? Oh, the image has a number of processes, and one of them is missing. There is a missing patch. Okay, so these kind of higher level programs can tell you, okay, what should really be there, right? So, okay, they, no, it's, it's, it, of course, anything can be there, but if I have to guess, I'll be saying, okay, yeah, it should be another process, right? So the program will tell you, okay, what are the patches that you should look into? And you can set them into a neural network, a generative network that learns to smart to ink paint on this Mr. region protocols there. Right, so the program at a higher level tell you what to do, and the neural network actually does it. Uh, and when it does it, you know, it learns to smartly leverage the power of these neural generative models. So it smartly blend all these patches. Uh, so you get an image with the patches with the patch being completed, but the, the cross itself doesn't look identical. It's not like just you know take a nearest neighbor and put it there, right? It looks natural, but also it doesn't look identical to any of the other patches. Then you can do other things, uh, just like what we can see what we saw before, but now with natural images, you can add another row of the crosses. Or, you know, program tell you where it believes the, the objects are supposed to be, but natural images are not perfect, right? Every object sort of deviates a little bit from their center. Um, so you can actually, in some sense, these are like deviations and you can try to magnify those deviations and to say, okay, how can I, you know, make this image more irregular, which will have uh, a lot of applications in industrial, you know, quality control and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, you can do that go uh, for, for the serial image as well. Uh, identify a program that explains it, uh, and in paint a missing serial, add another column of the serials, uh, and you know uh, magnify the irregularities uh, within the image. Okay, this is pretty cool. I feel like, um, but it's only you know it has, it has a strong something that is everything lies on a single plane. Right. And also you're seeing the plane from top down, you're like doing this, right? So you're not seeing it you know, in, in real world, if you take a picture, you know, uh, there are often multiple planes and you're seeing the plane from an angle, right? So we have this corridor, it has four planes, right? So is that possible to uh, build a model that then only, uh, then only works with one plane, but at least work with four planes, right? It's a kind of a small improvement. Okay, um, so turn out this can be possible. Uh, so what you need to do is you just need, need to make uh, kind of quite straightforward changes to, uh, to the program that we had before. Uh, that is, you first have to set the camera directions, right? Where, uh, how, um, where, where is the camera located, and and the orientations of the camera. And then you need to find smart ways to partition the image into multiple planes. And for every plane, you have to decide, uh, you have to infer its uh, orientations, right? The position of the of the plane as well as the surface normals of the, of the of the plane. Okay. Once you have all these information, then next steps become pretty straightforward because you know where the planes are, you know the camera positions, so you can actually rectify the plane. So you can say, okay, now I'm seeing it from angle. I can rectify it. Now I'm like seeing it from the top. Um, then you can just use exactly the thing we talked about before, trying to infer like these kind of, you know, maybe you can call it like a neural symbolic program, just but just for a single plane, right? Okay. So you have to do something extra and something kind of hard, but by doing that, you will be able to reduce the problem into problem you know how to solve. Okay, so let's look into this kind of extra step that is in particular, how we can partition the plane. So again, we're going to, in some sense, you're thinking about now you have to rectify, uh, sorry, now you have to vectorize an image, but image has multiple planes. So again, you know, you have to rely on some low level visual cues. So the cues we, we use are vanishing points uh, and uh, the wireframes. Um, you know, 3D wireframes, I think it's still kind of pretty hard, but you know, back then that's like three years ago, that's even harder. So it didn't really work that well. So we rely mostly on 2D wireframes. So you can see the lines here, they're actually all uh, in 2D in the image space. You know, you want to uh, go from these, you know, wireframes and vanishing point, these kind of bottom-up visual cues to help you to vectorize the image so that you can turn, you know, this image of multiple planes into, you know, okay, how to partition the planes and then how to rectify the planes and to get a program-like structure representation for it. So you can make an analogy, you know, compared with the earlier work, right? So in some sense, you're always sort of relying on some bottom-up visual cues, including, 
you know, for line joints, you're like, oh yeah, the, the world is made of lines-ish rectangles. So these are the, you know, I want you to detect these things. But you know, for single single plane images, now you go to the natural images. So you cannot really assume what the primitives are, but you're like, okay, I can try to vectorize the image by locating the centroids of these repeating objects. And now going to the, the multiple images case, uh, you want to go uh, bottom up, but now your bottom up visual cues are the vanishing points in the wireframes. Clearly, the problem gets harder and harder. You can draw an analogy here, but you know, and because the problem becomes harder, uh, it turned out that just you know relying on vanishing point in wireframes is you know not that uh, not as straightforward. Uh, especially if you look at the vanishing of the wireframes case, right? There are so many you know, lines there in two D, and you know, as humans, we have this strong prior that we have seen so many corridors. And we know, okay, that part, that pixel is part of the wall. That pixel is part of the floor. But how would a machine know that? And you know, if you just based on, uh, you know, you know, again, there is no training. Right? Everything's from a single image. So it'd be like, okay, if I'm just seeing all these wireframes, how would I know that particular region is part of the plane, uh, part of the wall, or part of the floor, right? So based on these vanishing point and wireframe inf information, you can generate a number of candidates uh, to partition the plane. And we know candidate two is correct and one and three are incorrect, uh, but the machine doesn't know, right? So, so what are the ways that we can, you know, try to, uh, uh, try to resolve this kind of ambiguity? Uh, so, you know, even based on kind of noisy, limited bottom-up visual cues, we can still partition the plane correctly. So our idea here, is you no know, the thing shouldn't be one way. It's not like you want to go all the way from bottom up. Oh, I want to first do visual cue extraction, identify the planes, and I see inside the problems. But it should also go top down. That is, I don't know which of these candidates are correct, but I have this strong intuition. You know, why is there any regularity in the image in the first place? It's because human view this corridor to be regular, to be symmetric, right? So you know, if you really are able to try to partition the planes the image into different planes, then the partition, each plane, and after, after you're done with the partition, after you rectify it, it should look so regular in the sense that the synthesized program should be much more simpler and should also explain the visual content much better. Okay, so the program itself is not only an output, final output of the entire process, but also informs you, okay, what are the right visual cues that you should rely on? So, what we mean here is, let's say we have three candidates. I don't know which one's correct. I'll just proceed. I'll run them through my algorithm and I can rectify you know, each plane under each possible partitions. And this is what you're going to get. You can see that you know, candidate two with the correct partition will give you much more regular planes after the rectification. And if you try to synthesize a program using you know, our early algorithm to explain what is during each, each plane, then you can see that the program for the second candidate uh, with all the partition planes will be much simpler. And you know, if you look at the reconstructions, it will much, also be much better. So the bottom up pro uh, plane partition process in the top down, uh, it's not still the top down program, the generated program should really help each other, inform each other, they should work together um, to uh, tell you that, okay, the second uh, candidate is the correct, uh, gives you the correct plane partition. Uh, and these are the wireframes that you should rely on. And also it gives you the simplest and the best programs. Okay, so the benefit of these algorithms is now you can do very long-term, long, -term, long uh, horizon view synthesis, right? Given a single input image, you can say, what happens if I move forward, right? If you compare with the baselines, you know, that's back in 2020, that's the state of the art. Uh, now you probably have better, but I, don't, I still don't think, you know, even with the uh, most impressive, uh, I would say recent long-term view synthesis methods like infinite nature and their follow-ups, you know, they can do really well uh, in the wild scenes. So I have to be totally clear, right? They don't make any assumptions about the structures in the image. So uh, for in the wild scenes that don't really have these structures, they probably work much better. But for scenes that do have these kind of structures, you know, you should expect the lights to, you know, getting larger and larger. And you should, instead of having a uh, kind of, you know, a distribution shift and in the long term, it just produces some blurry images. You can do other things like, you know, some other level of generalization and extrapolation. Oh, what will happen if you, uh, want to look to the top left, right? Um, so you look, if you look to the top left, you will be like, oh, I should expect another light uh, to come in, right? Instead of just producing something that's kind of totally blurry. Um, again, all these things are 3D aware, right? So, um, but you know, maybe one day Dell E and all this stuff, they can do this as well. So I, I don't think it's impossible. I think, it, you know, maybe in the long term, it, it will become possible if they can figure out the right inductive bias and the right data structure to data to train on. 
Um, but so far, I don't think any methods can do that. Um, and as well as uh, if you want to work backward, right, you should expect another light to come in as well, instead of just making the scenes kind of smaller. And finally, you know, what will happen if you turn around, right? So I, you know, I, I cannot tell, you know, what's really uh, going on in my back, but, and there are also, you know, infinite number of explanations. But if I could pick one, I would say, you know, I would synthesize an infinite corridor, right? Um, there's, <laughs> um, and so of course there are no, no infinite corridors, but this is actually real that, you know, the, the artist ori originated because I was like working the infinite corridor here in Dune Chen. I was like, okay, machine interview will do that as well, just from a single image. So this leads you to this line of work. Of course, I know it was all the fantastic collaborators, which I'm just going to show you the next time. But at least they can uh, just you know, still produce an infinite corridor, right? It's uh, pretty realistic. And uh, you know, the image extrapolation doesn't have to be from the inside. Let's think about it. If you're in a in a, in a corridor, then you're actually standing in a box, and you're inside a box. And if you're watching a building, then you're watching the, the same box, but you're seeing it from the outside, right? So it's exactly the same thing. Uh, with the only difference being here uh, for the for the building, you have two vanishing points. Well, for the corridor, you only have one, right? So everything else is the same. So you should be able to do the same thing about you know, making the building taller, as I showed at the beginning. And the baseline, some of them, you know, they only uh, respect uh, the structure of the 3D shape that well. Some of them are, are good, but then they don't respect the input. Um, so we can do better. Uh, and this is, you know, primarily all this line of work is done by uh, the, the two people. Uh, one is Chiang, who is sitting right here. Uh, and uh, that was back then, before he uh, started doing all this robotic stuff. Um, and uh, as well as Ikai, who is now a PhD student at Stanford. Okay, um, so in some sense, we can think about it as, you know, you know Kevin Ellis started uh, trying to apply these kind of neural programming synthesis for visual data, starting with, you know, line drawings, and then we try to generalize that to natural images and then going a little bit from you know 2D to some level of 3D, um, single plane to multi planes. So, so what's next? So you can argue that you know single plane learning is definitely in 2D. And if you have multiple planes, you know, clearly it's not 3D because you only have multiple planes. And I think it's arguably not even 2D and half D because it's more like a layered representation. But you know, at least we have some surface normals and stuff. So let's, let's just call it 2 and a half D. Um, so so what is next? Naturally, you know, we want to try to think about is it possible for us to do it in 3D? Um, so in particular, right, the structure state exists in the first place, you know, mostly because of you know humans introduce all kind of priors in the fabrication process. When we made these objects, made the tables, made the chairs, made the buildings, we want to look regular, right? Except for the C cell building. Uh, in most cases, <laughs> you want it to be regular and it, it makes you feel a bit better. Um, so that's why we have uh, all these structures. And in particular, for artifacts like you know, furniture, chairs, tables, they have very strong uh, abstract program like structures. The top of the table is round, can be you know, parameterized with a cylinder, and the legs are identical to each other. And then the layers at the bottom, they should be the same as well. So you have clearly structures there, right? That's why you, know, you have all these uh, uh, you know, you know, development in CAD modeling, and that's how they, basically how they're designed. So we, of course, we want to try to look into that as well. Um, so due to time constraint, I don't have time to talk about this line of work in detail, but you know, I'm going to quickly show uh, some results uh, uh, for Yongrong who is sitting here, because uh, he did a lot of work there. Um, but I have to talk more offline uh, for, for the 3D stuff. But uh, very quickly, uh, you know, in computer graphics, right? So there has been a lot of research uh, and you know, even from decades ago about using very compact representations like grammars, uh, they can actually represent very complex um, hierarchical uh, structures like two trees based on L systems or probabilistic context-free grammars uh, using symmetries to model 3D shapes, right? So most of these things, you know, they, um, uh, they, uh, they, they sort of just focus on, uh, I would say not only not the, not the inference part, but just like generation, how you can synthesize and, you know, but now in often cases, right, you know, at least in computer vision, we care mostly about you know, how to do the inverse process to infer what is the structure there based on input, which is often an image, or it can be a raw shape. Um, so, you know, Wojciech has done, uh, with Amando, right? I think they, done, they have done a lot of interesting work. You know, as an example, they have this inverse CSG paper that given the shape, you know, you try to infer uh, the fabrication process due on, you know, hierarchical structure about how this shape can be made. Um, and, you know, this is purely optimization. So it is given there's no real learning. Uh, so it's given a single shape. 
and just run a kind of optimization process to search for the explanations, uh, the best explanation. So you know, part of, part partially, uh, there's no learning because there's no data. Um, so you know, MIT and all of us later also had this Fusion 360 gallery data sets that you know they try to explain uh, build a collection and collection. I would say a set of optics, but not only their shapes, also how they can be made. Okay, so we didn't really use that data set, but you know, but inspired by this kind of work, we're like, okay, is it possible for us to do learning, right? So now you don't have to run a kind of test time optimization, which is kind of slow, but given a single shape, can we just you know instantly infer what's the structural representation for it? Uh, so that's the thing we did with Yolo, who is sitting right here. Uh, so we have neural networks that try to simplify, so given a shape, a program that explains the shapes. But of course, we don't have data, right? Where are the annotations coming from? You know, I, I don't really have annotations about the programs for shapes. So you do it by learning guided by execution. So you have another neural network that takes the program, execute it, and mostly try to reconstruct our original shape. So if we have the assumption of what these furniture often look like, you can write a DSL for it. Uh, then you can uh, now try to reconstruct the shape in this program representation. So the benefits are given an input image, you know, if you just re reconstruct it. Some broad representations like point clouds or meshes, the input view, right? The input is an image, and then the reconstruction is showing two views on the left is the same view as the input view. But you know, they look almost identical, right? There's not that much difference. But if you look at it from the other view, then you realize the top of the table is kind of having this weird triangular shape. But you know, we have this strong prior that the tabletop should be round. Um, you just cannot get that information from the input image. So you have to rely more on prior knowledge, which is what you believe the shape should look like. In this case, specified in the domain specific language and parameterized, you can parameterize it with shape program. And with that, you know, you can actually do a bit better. You know, still kind of pretty realistic, but with better uh, matches our intuition better. Um, this is like 2019. So most recently, we we'll also say, okay, there's no reason to assume the world is made of uh, lines and rectangles. Uh, so there's also no reason to assume shapes are made of cylinders and cuboids. And that seems very simplistic, right? We have all the advances in neural implicit representations for shapes, right? You know, it, it generates all the splashing uh, when, when NERF came out and everyone used it for radiance for in view synthesis. But before that, right, it, the implicit representations first get very popular with shapes, right? That's the DFS, DFS, stuff like that. So, you know, at least you should be able to use neural networks as, as the entry, as the leaves have the primitive to represent uh, what you believe these shape, shape primitives should look like, right? So in the case of airplane, you're like, oh, the wings are definitely the same, right? So the two wings have to be the same. So you can parameterize them with the same implicit neural network. Uh, but you know, it's now it looks much more realistic and capture the details, and it's no longer uh, just being a, a cuboid or a cylinder. So the same for chairs and tables as well. Okay, again, happy to talk about this offline because I think I don't have uh, too much time to go into detail into this line of work. Um, but finally, uh, I think I'm going to talk about uh, okay before. In 3D, so we can look around. Okay, I, I want to talk about the things that I feel most excited about. That is, um, you know, we say oh, there are structures there, uh, there are programs we represent, use that to explain, represent images and shapes. Um, but we spend all the time talking about how we can do it. But now the question is, why are they in the first place? And I think I sort of have mentioned it a few times in the talk. That is, you know, in many cases, that's because the you know, optics are there. Right, they're essentially the same type of glasses. Right, so the nature designed that to be like, like the, because there's natural hierarchy that's from the same category. Or alternatively, if you look into man-made artifacts, like the chairs and buildings and stuff like that, you know, it is because humans, right? Humans like things that are regular and they introduce it, uh, all these choirs when they're making these things, when they're fabricating objects, when they're constructing the buildings. Um, so, so these kind of program-like structure really originates from human preferences, especially if you look at, um, I would say objects, not maybe not scenes, right? So partly from nature, partly from humans. So let's, you know, uh, for artifacts, it mostly come from uh, the human preferences in the fabrication process. So if we look a bit deeper, uh, let's say we have an image of this vase, um, it looks kind of beautiful, right? Um, so uh, the vase itself is, a, is an RGB image, but you know, it, essentially you can always decompose it because the vase has different I would say, aspects. Right. So in computer vision, this is called intrinsic image decomposition. And here, you know, there are, what are the components here? One is surface normal, which is essentially representing the geometry, geometry of the, of the base. 
a beetle, which you can think about it as the color, right? So what is the painted color on, on the objects? The material, in this case, it's more about uh, you know, the reflectance, right? The vase, it looks like a porcelain, right? So have, have all the specular highlights, right? So, so it's the way it re reflects the light is determined by the material. That's well as the lighting conditions, right? So, you know, we can see the highlights here. So, you know, there must be some lights in the back or something, right? So, you can decompose into the few spectral components and environment maps. Okay. So, these are, you know, obviously the components that really form this image. And I'll later show why they are useful. Um, um, but are there any structure or programs um, or code uh, in just, you know, when we try to explain this image of a base? Or how do they connect to these components? Now let's first look at the shape, right? I would say the surface novel, so geometry of base is highly regular. It's, it's, it's really regular because when we when we try to you know make the base, right? So we just we have this particular setup that we, of course we know and we want it to be perfectly geometrically symmetric. If it's not, then we have a problem, right? So, so of course we want it to be perfectly regular, rotationally symmetric, which means it can be parameterized in what, what is what single vector. Um, so I would say, you know, for surface normals, it is, yeah, have some very strong expected regularities. And what about material? You know, material is the, is the same because we have, when we're going to make this wave, we know it must be made of the same material, right? So although every pixel on this image, you know, they look very different. But we know that every point on this base will reflect the light in the same way, right? So this is how the base is made. It's not like it has two parts and every part has a different material. So you know, I should be able to actually have the confidence to say every pixel or every point on this base should reflect the light in the same way, right? So I, I can I should be able to assume that it's homogeneous and the same parameterization for material should apply anywhere. So we have surface normals and materials, and I would say there are a lot of you know explicit regularities there. Okay, so what about a beetle, which is the color? Now, clearly, it is not as regular, right? It has all those kind of fancy patterns there. It is not like it's a pure color base. Right? It's just uh, white or, or blue or something, right? But I would say it still looks kind of similar to me, right? Every patches on this base, you know, they look like similar, very perceptually similar to me. Although their similarity is not captured in the way that it's okay if you can compute the pixel level uh, RGB value differences. So I would say there's a little bit of implicit regularities in diabetes or in textures or colors. And what about lighting? Um, of course, sometimes lighting do have a little bit of structure. If you look at, you know, in this room, you know, or uh, thinking about a coral case, which uh, we talked about before, sometimes it does have some structures. But in general cases, I would say, especially indoor, the lighting is like so complex that we just uh, forget about it. So I would say these are, <laughs> so these are just not, not regular. Okay, uh, so now the question is, you know, in computer vision, we care a lot about increasing the composition. How can we decompose the image into surface normals, abidos, and lightings and materials? Um, but this problem is so hard, you know, because all these things they go put together to form the original image. So there's like a times b equals one. So now you're given one, but you want to input a and b. How is that possible? It's not possible at all, right? So you have to rely on some kind of prior knowledge about okay, what the intrusion image looks like. What makes the problem even worse is there's absolutely no way to really collect very large scale. Uh, I would say annotations of data for these interesting images, right? So for Abido, you know, MIT, like uh, uh, almost 10, more than 10 years ago, 2018, so 15, 14 years ago, created a data set of, we call it MIT intrusive image data set, and has images of uh, 20 Abido images of objects. It's still being used uh, just because no one can really do much more than that. Uh, it's just so time consuming. So, 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 it doesn't have, so you don't have large data set, you cannot do supervised learning. And now you want to solve this, you know, intrinsically ambiguous problem. So how is that even possible? So you have to rely on some prior knowledge, inductive biases. And here we discover some inductive biases. That is, you know, parts of the intrinsic images like surface novels and materials, they are more regular. And Abidos is sort of implicitly regular and the other things not as regular. So we have this a little bit of, you know, bias or asymmetry. So can we leverage such kind of asymmetry um, for image understanding and decomposition. And once we can do that, you know, we'll be able to, um, we'll be able to, you know, once you can do that, you can decompose the image into surface normals and lighting. Then you can see an object from a different view. You can relight it. Um, I think that would be great. So um, we start to look into this problem. And that's the time that I was at Google. And, you know, almost at the same time, there is this CVPR 2020 best paper. Uh, they actually use symmetry for shape recovery. So they have a kind of very similar observation 
although they were presented in a very different way. So the, here's my reinterpretation of that. That is, uh, given the image, you know, you want to see the shape of the face in, in the image, and you want to, you know, decompose it into depths and abidos and light and stuff like that. But the only thing that is, you know, face is reflectional symmetric. But the only thing that is indeed reflectional symmetric is depth map, which is the geometry, and the abido, right, which is, you know, the color of the face. And the light itself is not, a, it's not you know, because you cannot, you, you're trying to infer where the light is. So what they did is they say, okay, if I flip the face horizontally, but I only flip the depth map and albedo map, and I keep the lighting, and I try to re-render the image, it should look identical uh, to the same image, to the input image, right? So the only flip part of the intrinsic images is to just give you the same thing. Just with one observation, uh, you know, uh, they were able to reconstruct human faces in GSVE. You can see them from different views, all from a single image without supervision. And they won best paper at the Dr. Tony So this was done by Ilya Wu, uh, who was a student, uh, still a student, PhD student at BGG from our University of Oxford. Um, so then um, he came to Google as an intern. Um, so we were like, is it possible for us to extend his uh, previous work? But now for this image understanding problem, so instead of just assuming, oh, there's refractive symmetry, or some has symmetry, some doesn't have symmetry, and focus in particular on shape reconstruction, can we make it more general? That is, okay, we rely on this implicit or explicit structure, uh, but we use it for image de-rendering, right? So that you can only decompose an image into 3D, uh, but you know, really decompose it into surface normals, abidos, and materials uh, with the asymmetries that we have just observed and explained. Uh, with the application of you know non view synthesis, now we can go from a single image, seeing the vase from different viewpoints, as well as we relight it, right? Again, this is all unsupervised, and um, this one does have a data set to train on, so we have a collection of unannotated vases, just like previous one has a data set of unannotated faces. But during testing, just going from a single image, again, nothing is annotated. You can do non view synthesis and relight it. Okay, so now let me explain how we're able to introduce these kind of different levels of regularities on inductive biases into basically a neural network. Um, so let's first start with shape, right? So you have an input image, and we said shape is explicitly regular, which means we know it is rotationally symmetric. So which means if the shape is perfectly rotationally symmetric, you will be able to parameterize it with two numbers. One is the height, and this is our, with two elements. One is the height, which is a single number, and the second is the radius, which is a vector, because you can represent, okay, the radius of every point uh, at different heights. And you also infer the camera position, which is the pose. Okay, so here you're explicitly assuming the shape is rotationally symmetric, is you know, regular. And what you can do is you can re-render the scene, and you know, based on the shape and camera poses, you can compute the silhouette, and then you can compute the differences between a reconstructed silhouette and a ground truth silhouette. So this is the first loss where you're trying to enforcing the, uh, the explicit regularities of the geometry. Okay, so now we have the shape, you can unwrap the object, right? So you can get the surface normal maps and texture map, you can unwrap it, think about it as a piece of paper, you can unwrap it. Uh, and then you can do the standard uh, interest image decomposition thing, that is you try to infer the abidos, uh, and then you try to infer the light and materials. Uh, and you can you know, use that to re-render uh, uh, it compute uh, the diffuse and specular maps, and then to reconstruct the texture and to put it back uh, with the camera poses to reconstruct the original image. And then uh, you have a second reconstruction loss. That is how the vase looks like compared with the original image. First, you compare with silhouette. Second, you compare with uh, RGB values. Uh, and here you're introducing the second assumption that is the object is homogeneous. It's made of the same material, right? So you can see that the material, you know, it's not like, Spatial variant, you're not parameterizing it in a spatial, spatially varying way. Uh, you're assuming that every point on this object, on this face, has the same material. So you can always parameterize it, you know, using a few parameters and you apply it to every point on the on the base. Okay. So these are kind of pretty standard thing. Um, so now let's go into this more interesting case. That is, you have this uh, intrinsically, I would say implicitly regular albedo. So how would you how would you enforce that? Right, so you can see that we're trying to infer albedo at the bottom, and um, we know it kind of you know looks similar to me every patch is in albedo. But how can we introduce that into a neural network? Um, so the first thing we did is okay, given it looks kind of similar to me, you know if we average them, right, and if we have a single color mean albedo, 
And I just assume this is actually the, the right albedo. Uh, and I can, you know, again, put that back into this rendering pipeline, re-render the vase, and then, you know, uh, rewrap it. Uh, and then you can have this, you know, mean albedo reconstruction. It should still look kind of similar to the input image, right? So, because, you know, although the albedo, every, every pixel is kind of different, you know, they're kind of similar in the sense that if we average them, it shouldn't look that different. Okay, this is a one straightforward way of enforcing uh, the regularity. But I think now it's most important it has this more interesting way of enforcing regularity. That is, okay, what does it mean by the video map look kind of similar to me, right? I think in many ways it means like, okay, if you sample a patch from this video map, then it should, I should not be able to tell, you know, which part or which you know, region is the patch coming from. And this is in particular the case for uh, decomposing spectral objects. You know, looking at this phase, which is kind of highly spectral, you can see that there are two regions that are, you know, uh, almost pure white, right? So these regions are the, are the most challenging regions in interesting competition. Because if you look at RGB values of these patches, which let me see if I can, okay. You know, so here is where my mouse is at, right? So um, these regions, if you, you know, open preview and look at RGB values of these regions, You'll see that they're often overexposed, they're like pure white. So RGB values like 2055, 2055, And so there's absolutely no signal that, oh, there's a pure white pixel. But you have to go from that pure white pixel to input what is the underlying true color of the base at a particular position. But you just don't have signals. So this is a big challenge. And a lot of the existing methods will be like trying to do something and still look kind of whitish, right? But our observation is because you understand that Avito is, you know, should look similar to everywhere. So if you randomly sample patches from this Avito map, and no matter whether these patches are coming from a region, input region that is highly specular, or it is coming from a region that is not specular at all, it should look the same to us, right? So it should look the same no matter where these patches are. That means it should also look the same to the machines. So by uh, looking the same to the machines, that means if we have a discriminator, they should not be able to tell uh, which uh, uh, where the patches are coming from. So what we did in this uh, self-supervised albedo discriminator is um, you have the predicted albedo maps, you have the predicted spectral maps, and you can sample patches from this albedo map uh, sorted by very uh, their 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 uh, varying uh, specularity, right? So now you have albedo patches from regions that are not specular at all, at least specular and albedo patches from regions that are most specular. Uh, and if you send those patches into albedo discriminator, the albedo discriminator should not be able to tell if the patches are coming from a non-specular region or a specular region, because they should just look the same. Right? So this is kind of the biggest challenge because before the, the, the albedo patches from the highly specular regions often look you know, whitish, uh, but now by asking the discriminator to tell, uh, to classify, and now the generator learns to confuse the discriminator, then it has to generate albedo patches even that look realistic, that are similar to other regions, even for regions that are highly speculative. So this is kind of a very implicit way of, but I think it's a smart way of enforcing this implicit regularity that is, okay, the object have similar textures everywhere, right? Okay, so putting all the, everything together, uh, what we can do is going from a single image of a base, uh, you can decompose it into surface normals, albedos, and all these you know, intrinsic images. And once you have that information, um, again, going from a single image, you can virtualize it. You can see it from different views. And you can rely it. And here are a different data set, which is uh, more challenging. Uh, with more complex background and stuff like that. And it's also different from the training data set that we have. Uh, you can do the same thing about intrusive image decomposition, as well as you know, going from single image, virtualizing objects, seeing them from different views, and relighting. You know, some of these images are painting, but you can still do it. Uh, it still works pretty well there. Right, so uh, after we're done with this work, we, I learned there's something called a metaverse. So maybe it is like 
you're trying to recreate objects in the metaverse and building a digital twin of the objects. Um, so that's something I learned after we published this work. Uh, what should, should happen in the abstract? Um, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, that's mostly it. You know, we try to extend our structures to 3D uh, to represent and capture the regularities and shapes, but also, you know, to, de to define right, what these primitives should look like and to, to also learn the definition, the meaning of these primitives and uh, to understand, you know, by leveraging why these structures are there in the first place allows you uh, to do, I think, pretty general things, you know, uh, with very minimal assumptions uh, and also don't have, don't require any annotations. So you can do single image and, and unsupervised now because since it's in reality. And I think they work pretty well. Um, one thing I don't have time to talk about, we can talk more offline, is of course, there are also structures in time domain, you know, objects may move and stuff like that. So, you know, we should be able to leverage that to better understand things like human motions. Okay, uh, so just to summarize, right? So we're saying, okay, we we'll try to understand the visual world through code. And, you know, what we're doing here is kind of, um, you know, pretty standard, right? It's like, oh, everyone's saying, you know, you have some neural networks recognition and you have some programs for generalization. But I think there's some something that's more different that is, um, is you can see that first programs can be defined in a very broad way. Right, so in many cases, people are like, oh, program is something that you have a for loop, just like we showed in the first work, and it doesn't generalize because not everything has a for loop, you know, in a, in a while, which is probably true. But I would say in many cases, these programs can be defined in a very general way that makes them really generalizable, just like in the last work, we're like, yeah, I feel like there is some code or symbolic structures, in particular, for example, on the albedo map or the textures of objects, but it is so hard to describe that clearly there's no for loop, right? So, but you can still smartly enforce them uh, into these image understanding systems, uh, but it doesn't really hurt your generalization, it actually really helps their generalization and significantly require, uh, reduces their uh, requirement of the data because everything now can be, you know, smartly learned uh, from unannotated data. So then the second is, you know, if you say, okay, these programs have very different structures, but how would you define them? Where are they coming from? So that's, I think, what we mean by naturally supervised. I would say, you know, they primarily, of course, they come from two sources. One is from the nature, because the existence of objects, you know, evolution, objects have hierarchies, right? How would you be able to enforce those? That's where the intrinsic, intrinsic uh, internal learning stuff, why they're so powerful. But the second, of course, is from humans, right? When we're eventually, when we're building things, when we're constructing them, we inevitably, in, uh, I would say, in, introduce all the priors and, you know, preferences that we have, and most of them, you know, they are often symbolic, but symbolic in different ways. You know, not symbolic from the for loop. Sometimes they are for loops, but <laughs> symbolic in sometimes can be in very subtle ways. But if you can find smart ways uh, to introduce the kind of naturally supervised priors into the system, I think that would be uh, really help your system to generalize, reduce our hurting, you know, their two natural images. And because people often say it only works on symbolic and synthetic, Indoor environments, you know, you can actually make them work on um, very general data. Um, um, and I think we didn't get people come up with. So so there would be uh, it's about in Sorry, I think there was a connection issue, so I have to switch to a different Wi-Fi. Um, but yeah, okay. Um, so what's next? You know, of course, we wanted to work on even more general scenes. Um, you know, this is a scene from the moving section, where you know you can clearly a lot of you know structures there. The columns are the same. You know, but uh, there's lighting, complex lighting effects, and there are things that are not as regular as the background, you know, like the trees and buildings and stuff like that. Um, so okay, is that possible for us to uh, generalize there? Uh, 
um, as well as in the many rows of symbols earlier, you know, they can be represented and defined in a very broad way. Um, but, you know, let's say if you want to define it in a more narrow way, uh, that is, it is, you know, some highly structured and non-convex stuff, then it often poses a challenging inference, right? So it's kind of really hard to scale up. Um, so is it possible to develop more efficient inference algorithm for those as well? And finally, everything here we talked about, they're, you know, mostly passive, right? There's no actions and stuff like that. But, you know, if it is embodied AI examiner or embodied intelligence examiner, you know, of course you want to interact with the scenes as well. Um, so how to connect that to action? And as I said, uh, just right before I was frozen, you know, clearly any of these, a lot of these have a lot of connections to um, what humans believe they have in their brain um, and um, to, co to cognition and to language. Um, and again, it's another source of, I believe, a natural supervision. So hopefully we can make more progress there as well. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jajin, so much for giving such a great talk. Uh, now, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to ask them. Let me check. Okay, so I have a quick question then. So, so uh, I was uh, really impressed by how you were able to decompose all the in intrinsic parameters of like the base. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, what if you had like more uh, scenes where like the, the object isn't like canonically like centered, or it's like there's like multiple objects in the scene. Do you think what are the challenges towards the current approach? And like, how do you think you could like resolve some of these? Yeah, that's a good point. That's what we're uh, trying to work on right now. Um, you know, I think the the base thing still has some assumptions in the sense that, you know, you're saying the world is rotationally symmetric. And yeah, you know, you have some assumption about camera poses, not as much actually, um, but it's more about the geometry. Um, so how does, you know, because and sometimes you're like, yeah, there, there are objects that are not really rotation symmetric, how would it work there? Um, you know, if you were as you would do, did you go to CVPR and Josh give a keynote where he showed a number of pictures mm -hmm. about, you know, those in the wild objects and they're kind of a collection of them. I take a picture of what is going on here, the chairs are the same, but then, you know, they're no longer rotation symmetric. But in some sense, they actually give you very important signals because look at all these different chairs, they're under slightly different lighting conditions, just like the columns, and you're seeing them from slightly different viewpoints. So it actually, in some sense, it serves as a, you know, as a, uh, a monkey view image for free. Um, so how you can leverage all these signals um, to, to do things that are more general without requiring the assumptions of uh, objects being rotational symmetric, I think that's very interesting. That's what we're working on right now. Cool. Yeah. And I guess very related to your previous question, uh, I guess you also mentioned like action. Do mm -hmm. you think how, how do you think action could also play a role in trying to like discover these components or like how you know, like how? Yeah. But so, so, so there are two things it sounds like we were saying. One is um, one is what you just said, that is, okay, interaction or action itself, can it serve as a role that you're learning a policy to more effectively or efficiently discover these structure? And there is a second question that is, uh, the actions themselves have structures there. So uh, do you really need any of these, you know, structural repetitions for actions uh, in addition to for perceptions? Oh uh, yeah, I was just the first one. <laughs> okay. but, but actually second one's also just the uh, uh, Okay, uh, first one, um, I think yes, but again, you have to interpret it as in a more, in, in a broader way that is, you know, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to say you have actions and you discover there are like objects, you have four loops or something. But it probably make a lot of sense in the embodied AI environment where you know objects have those states and you know the predicates and you know you know, well, how we can efficiently discover a C reputation at a lot right level abstraction that is minimal but also sufficient. And they can, you know, and I think you know if you can have smart policies to or actions or to discover what is really needed um, and represent them uh, in a complex embodied way, I think that would be very useful. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, does anyone else? Yes. Nice. Thank you for your very nice and inspiring talk. Thank you for working on shape programs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I did have one question about this general universe going to stop. That is, um, it it somehow seems to me that um, for new learning uh, program synthesis, every time we run to new problem or new data set or new thing, we somehow have to somehow to find a specific domain language for that specific mm -hmm. data set. So that bothers me a bit. So how how we can generalize make this more generalized to different problems or different data sets. So 
I wonder, um, so you had a visionary for this direction. What do you think would be the way that makes us towards a little bit more general? Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I think there I have two answers for that. One is, you know, on a conceptual level, I'll oh, repeat a question for Zoom. Uh, I think the question is, uh, you know, if we, if any symbolic or program like stuff requires a DSL that is domain specific, how would you generalize to new domains? That's my paraphrase of the yeah. question. Um, so I think I have two responses for that. And first is at a conceptual level. Um, yeah, that's a very good point. But these DSLs are not that different in the sense that if you think about where they're coming from, that's what I said when I was at this keynote, when I was frozen, uh, that is um, essentially these things, they're not, if you, yes, I agree with you that if you come up, have to come up with new structures or program for every domain, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't generalize. But essentially, these structures they exist for a reason. And most, you know, more generally, I would say there are two reasons. One is, you know, objects, the evolution, they have categories, the higher hierarchies. So you can rely on that. And second is, you know, it's, it's because we're humans. And in, 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 you know, if you look at computer graphics and how the images render, you know, there are not that many components, and humans just have different priors for these uh, for these different components. So it's, you know, it's 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 an actually a pretty limited space. Um, so that's that response on conceptual level. At a methodological level, uh, I think you know you can come up with methods that with minimal specifications, but also try to discover the DSLs themselves, like Dream Code as an example. Although it doesn't generalize so far that well now, but I think that's kind of a promising direction that you know hopefully uh, we can do better with these methods. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, Okay, great. Yeah, thanks so much for giving such a great talk. I'm really excited to have you here at the seminar. Sure.